Uh, I want to welcome all of you to uh, the Middle East Institute uh, today for uh, our program on Yemen. Uh, we are uh, very fortunate to have with us today uh, two uh, colleagues uh, who are not only extremely experienced and knowledgeable about the situation, uh, but also have been uh, recently visitors uh, to Yemen and can provide, I think, a very fresh perspective on the situation on the ground uh, here, uh, um, there, uh, as we move into uh, what potentially is a new phase uh, in, the, uh, in the conflict. Uh, I, uh, I would like to uh, ask everybody to silence your phones. Uh, we are live streaming uh, this uh, event. Uh, it is uh, public. Uh, and uh, and uh, um, I guess uh, if you want to tweet, we do welcome people tweeting. So uh, without, without further ado, uh, let me introduce our two guests today. Uh, Basma Alush is uh, the Advocacy uh, and Communications Officer at the Norwegian Refugee Council, uh, and uh, Free Al Muslimi, uh, from the Sana'a Center, uh, has asked to be introduced as al Qaeda al uh for the uh, Sana'a Center. So, um, so let me, uh, let me uh, ask both of them uh, to uh, talk a little bit about their recent experiences, uh, what they saw while they were in Yemen, <coughs> what, uh, what their thoughts are on the current situation. Uh, we'll do that for about 30 minutes uh, after that. Uh, we will have about a 30-minute conversation uh, to talk about the current uh, situation, uh, what we anticipate uh, not only uh, on the ground in Hodeida, but also uh, perhaps uh, what uh, we might hope for uh, from Martin Griffith's uh, recent, uh, uh, recent uh, travels and negotiations. Uh, and then the last 30 minutes, we will invite members of our audience to uh, ask questions. So uh, with that, let me turn first to Basma uh, and ask her to kick off. Thank you, Ambassador Firestein and MEI for this generous opportunity and I think for convening this very timely discussion. Um, some background on the Norwegian Refugee Council. We've been operating in Yemen since 2012. We work in about 20 of the 22 governorates and we work within different sectors. So within our education programs, we provide, for example, we, we rehabilitate schools, um, we provide training for teachers, and we provide some school materials for students. We also have our water and sanitation or our wash programs um, and shelter, but we also have our livelihoods and food security programs where we provide unconditional cash assistance or cash vouchers so that people can buy what they most need instead of us um, trying to tell them what they, you know, providing things that they may not need. And lastly, um, we have our information counseling and legal assistance program where we help Yemenis get access to civil documentation and legal services in times of displacement. So I think, you know, I can, I can sit here and talk to you guys for 10 minutes or so about Yemen in numbers and we can talk about the 8.4 million people on the brink of famine. We can talk about the 12.9 million people in need of some form of protection or the 4.1 million children without access to education or just the overall 22.2 .2 million people in need of some form of humanitarian assistance. But I think when I decided to go to Yemen mid-April to early May, I really wanted to go and learn how the conflict was actually impacting civilians and really trying to look at Yemen through humans as opposed to numbers. So I think if, if you'll allow me, um, I, I want to kind of paint a picture for you of what the average Yemeni household um, has really experienced since 2015, what their life has been. This is something I went to Adan and Sana'a, and I think at least from my short trip there, this is something I experienced or I witnessed from both sides of the, of the, of the country, if, you, if I may so, you know. Um, so f just to, to give you a sense of what people are really going through, since 2015, you know, an average Yemeni family, middle class um, in Sana'a, for example, mm -hmm. Had, you know, they lived in a rented apartment in the middle of the city. 
Um, both the mother and the father were civil servants. Um, they worked in the, public, in the public sector. The mom was a teacher. The father was an accountant at one of the municipalities. They had four children, two boys, two girls. The eldest was about 13 years old. The youngest, 11 months old. The children were in school. The mom had a family, you know, the family network to help her with the, the raising of her youngest daughter while she was at work. The, the father had his parents um, in the house with them. The average Yemeni household was about seven people. Now in the conflict, that number has increased to about 25 to 30 people, all on the same limited resources and limited income. Um, and over the conflict, as you know, after 2015, the family was still, you know, being doing well, kind of surviving. Um, they were safe. They continued to live in their place, but they just became more conscious of the surrounding risks. As prices began to rise, the Yemeni um, real rapidly started to depreciate. They started to prioritize and maybe shorten some of their grocery lists. Instead of going to the large supermarket chains and buying imported goods, they would choose to go to the local stores and buy, you know, maybe slightly lesser quality goods, um, but at cheaper prices. Then, you know, the, a few months went by, the parents stopped receiving their salaries. They, you know, despite the number of promises that they've received, you have about 1.25 million civil servants. That's about six or seven million Yemenis that haven't had uh, their, their salaries paid um, in about two and a half to three years. And the family is now basically tapping into their savings to buy food, to buy medical expenses for the grandparents, schooling for the children, bills, rent, fuel, cooking gas, etc. Now the family has basically eliminated non-essential foods. Meat is usually the first thing to go because it's just too expensive. Um, the number of uh, meals that they eat per day has decreased. They focus more on trying to, to pay rent. The non-payment of salaries has basically completely depleted their savings. The mom and the mother-in-law now start selling off their assets. So whatever jewelry they had, they start to sell that off to pay rent, to buy food, to pay for other expenses. The father is now forced to find alternative work um, in addition to the work that, you know, going to the ministry and not being paid. He's forced to find something um, in the afternoons, keeping him away from his family, but just any daily labor to kind of compensate or to make some sort of minimal income um, to try to provide for the family as well. All this while prices continue to spike, um, fuel continues to be very expensive, and cooking gas as well. Now the family can no longer afford rent. Um, but luckily, you know, some people, um, the landlord is, is patient, understanding, is cutting the family some slack. So they're, for the time being, able to stay in that, um, in, that, in that apartment. But now the family also turns to the furniture. And they start selling furniture. And they start selling all their assets until all they have left are these thin foam mattresses that basically are used to sit and sleep on. And that's all they have in this apartment. Now the situation has deteriorated significantly in the country. Um, the family is even now confronted with much more difficult decisions to make. They're trying, you know, all of these difficult um, ultimatums or situation that they're, they're finding themselves in all limits the, the heavy airstrikes that they're having to basically dodge. Their children, the youngest daughter, she grew up under airstrikes. All she knows is airstrikes. Um, and trying to deal with the psychosocial issues that are produced after um, being in a situation like that, I think are, are very long-term um, and very immense for a family to endure. When I was in Sana'a, about 50% of the time that I was there, there were heavy airstrikes. Um, every time you hear a plane hovering, you have to think of you know, where you have to go. You run down to the basement. You seek shelter wherever is closest. Two weeks after I left Sana'a, I was still dealing with that sense of, you know, uh, nervousness, that anxiety, trying to, you know, every time I heard a plane, every time a, a car engine revved or anything like that, any loud noise would make me very anxious. I would start, you know, contingency planning in my head, trying to figure out ways where I can assure my safety, plan out my escape route. 
but unfortunately, in civilians, especially in Sana'a, with the airport's closure um, since 2016, they haven't been able, there is no escape route. Um, and all this, again, while fuel prices continue, continue to increase, cooking gas is unaffordable. My first three days in Sana'a as part of an international NGO, we weren't allowed to cook in our guest house because cooking gas prices were just too expensive. And this is us making, you know, getting our grants in dollars, not Yemeni rials. Um, you know, so you can only imagine what a Yemeni family was experiencing trying to find minimal income in a, in a currency that is constantly fluctuating. Um, so at least for this family now, you know, and this again is just an example to show you because it is across the country. They're forced to, to turn to subsidized fuel and gas prices. I think after I left, actually, the, the government subsidies ended. Um, but while they were still, they were still going on, um, the father typically had to choose between waiting in line for two days to get the subsidized fuel and gas prices, and which means he would have to forego income for a day or two, or the woman would be uh, would be the person waiting in line and think you know putting them putting the woman in the situation where she's vulnerable to harassment to strangers on the street. Um, sometimes they take children, which means children are also taken out of school, but. These are basically the, the everyday lives um, of the Yemenis. The giant supermarket chains are still fully stocked. Um, you can buy all kinds of imported goods, um, but the local stores that used to sell things at affordable prices now are forced to close shop because they're having to pay taxes by the local authorities, but at the same time, customers are not able to afford buying these products. Um, so. There's no, there's no profit coming in to offset the costs of operating, so it just becomes too expensive. I mean, just sadly, this is the reality for millions of Yemenis today. Once the support system weakens and all the assets are sold, the choices become even more limited. Um, many people pile on debt that they can't pay. Lenders stop lending. Um, some, children, some people remove their children from school to, to, to get them um, to, so they can work and kind of bring in some additional income for the family. Others look to marrying their young daughters, either for protection or for the dowry. And you have things like sex work, begging, garbage eating. Um, they've all increasingly become tactics to stay alive and provide for the family. Now, even within this depressing context, I did want to highlight one incredible and unique characteristic that um, just, you know, I think was completely fascinating um, to the Yemeni society, and it's basically their interconnectedness. Um, even amidst this conflict, you see the people's humanity shines in different ways. And I was going to the office, um, I think after spending a week in Sana'a, and one of my colleagues looked deeply, deeply upset. And when I asked him about what was troubling him, he started expressing the shame and the pain that he was feeling after finding out that his neighbor had gone without food for three days. Now that's a reality in Yemen. Millions of people, um, as I've mentioned, you know, are going without food. But the fact that my colleague didn't know that his neighbor, and this is his neighbor, this isn't his blood relative, this isn't his extended family, part of his larger household, this is his neighbor that hadn't eaten in three days, and he was completely and utterly embarrassed by the idea that his next door neighbor hadn't eaten, and he didn't know, and immediately, his efforts were increased to try to raise for that family, to try to provide for that family, to raise awareness about their situation so that the community can really come together. And I think just this interconnectedness and these intercommunal relationships have really been the only thing that have left Yemenis this far from complete collapse and from seeing higher numbers um, you know, die because of the, the food, this food situation and the non-payment of salaries. But at the same time, these, these you know, communal ties are really fraying. And they're very, very weak right now because every social class has essentially collapsed on the other. You have people for, falling more in need as the days go by and as the conflict prolongs. So once this conflict, you know, once, you know, with the new rounds of escalation that we're seeing, with the new rounds of violence, I think that's just going to prolong conflict. It's just going to prolong um, the suffering 
on these innocent civilians, and it's just going to continue to eventually, until eventually this connectedness collapses, and this social network that's available, holding people barely afloat, is going to completely collapse, and we're going to see higher and higher numbers of people dying, of people falling in more need, of people depending more on humanitarian organizations like the Norwegian Refugee Council, where we're continuously struggling to even meet the needs. Because the sheer numbers are so great, and because the obstacles of operating inside a country so conflict-ridden like Yemen are just making our work very difficult in trying to reach the millions, and having that collapse in the, in the social system is really going to make it that much harder and eventually <coughs> almost impossible for us um, to, to really meet the needs of everyone in Yemen. I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Basma. Thank you for that, uh, uh, for that uh, presentation. And let me, uh, uh, let me uh, turn to Faria now and uh, ask the same, if you could uh, just give your sense of having seen the situation on the ground, where, where sure. you think things are. Sure. I mean, though she really left nothing to say. Um, <laughs> but um, what I will, therefore, what I will do is say very five quick, uh, very quick five points, and then I, I really want to jump to Hadaida because okay. I think that's uh, the important topic at the moment. Though I must warn you, if you are looking for any optimism, you can leave the room now um, <laughs> uh, before we start talking. Um, I think there are five things I would like to share from my uh, trip to Yemen, which I think most of you already know or are aware of. Um, one, yes, there is a terrible, uh, one of the worst crises in the world, but what's really, I've seen this for the first time, what's really terrible in, this, in, in Yemen at the moment is the unseen price of war. What she's describing and what we see in TV is the scene of price of war. You have so many millions hungry, you have dead people, you have things and so on. But imagine you have right now two million children out of school. Imagine what the generation we will have in five years, uh, what the generation we will have in 10 years. And I think that is the most terrifying thing that you see in Yemen. Um, the price of war has reached so many levels and so many ways that it's no more even tangible or touchable or even something we can give an attention to and look into. Um, with this in mind, and as you were saying, there isn't in Yemen, uh, you know, and this is surprising to many people, there isn't looting, there isn't, there is hungry, there isn't uh, fighting as much as you would imagine. But what, one of the trends we have seen uh, uh, highly increasing over the last uh, three years is the, the, the rate of society commitment. Um, and we have seen in few times in, in around the country where people killed them, their families and their children and then killed themselves because they could not afford food anymore. Um, Yemenis would not kill each other for food, but most probably would kill themselves um, for not being able to have food, even if that's not um, their fault. Um, another thing I, I think, and this is a summary of really how extremely difficult it is to live in Yemen at the moment, is um, I went to Sana'a um, and I drove all the way to Hadramaut to find an airplane, 25 hours. Um, that's because Sana'a airport keeps, continues to be shut down, um, even right now by the coalition and the Yemeni government. 25 hours between Sana'a and Hadramaut takes you around 128 checkpoints in the road of all sorts of checkpoints you have. And imagine that for good, imagine that for insurance, imagine that to transfer anything around the country. Um, and in fact, if you go to Hadramaut, you have to wait two to three weeks, if you're lucky, um, to find the ticket to fly to Cairo. Um, and that ticket is uh, $1,000 cost, actually. It's more expensive than the ticket from Beirut to, to the United States of America. There are three planes that serve 27 million people in Yemen. Something should have never been, and actually something can be solvable. But again, there has been a constancy um, to shut down the Sana'a airport, which seems to be one of the most obvious collective punishment, um, and no one do anything about it. And in, 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 in these 25 hours of a drive, you almost have a three Yemens. You have the Houthis one, you have the Hadramis one, and you have the thing in the middle, which is um, um, Marib, which is the National Army Islamist, and any northerner who's basically against um, the Houthis, because they also cannot go to Aden. In these areas, in these three Yemens you have on the ground, there is more or less every Yemen has its own borders, its own taxations, its own army, its own security and it's all a bunch of guys and a bunch of power, uh, more or less. There was one thing until two years ago keeping this country together, and that was, in addition to the Qad dealers, the Central Bank of Yemen. 
Um, and unfortunately, until the Yemeni president decided to do one of the most catastrophic decisions ever by reallocating it, he tore apart the last transcript of the Yemeni state we had in Yemen, let alone that on the level of destruction it has done to the public wage, to the salary, and to the functionality of the state. My third point is about life in Sana'a. Contrary to front lines, Sana'a is not actually as damaged as you would imagine it. Um, there is still life, there are things around it. What's in Sana'a is hunger, um, hunger more than anything else. Hunger in Sana'a have killed more people than the war itself. Um, you see people with really clean clothes, as clean as yours, begging in the street, because again, they were actually doing well, and recently they were pushed off the edge. Um, they're as good in the market as you mentioned, there is everything you can think of, though I think that will change soon with Hudayda battle. Uh, but there is no cash, basically. You have 1.2 million have not been paid their salaries for the last 19 months. That has starved more Yemenis than the war itself. These uh, 1.2 uh, million people sponsor 6 million Yemenis. These were the last group of Yemenis that were not on the edge um, and are actually um, uh, now suffering. And that's why one thing we, we always have as a recommendation even uh, more than eight is we think that the number one thing should be done in Yemen is pay salaries to the public people, to the public sector. Pay salaries to the social welfare. The social welfare is even more critical component of Yemen. This is um, very little almost by the new currency exchange at $20, um, but it paid for the least, uh, uh, the least lucky Yemenis. It was social welfare. Um, and since September 2014, only one time that was paid recently by UNICEF, I think, our World Bank, uh, for the first time, which is important. Social welfare is probably even more important to pay um, than, the, than the salaries themselves. One of the big counterparts we usually hear about this is it's a follow for problems, which is true, fair enough. The social welfare is not the most functioning or the cleanest system. But one, it is a system there, uh, and it's a structure that exists. Two, the problems or the financial problems of this specific organizations are not even as half as the overheads of the international organizations. And we have calculated that actually as a matter of research um, in, 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 in the past. My, and speaking of organizations, I think also this is, in Sana'a is one of the toughest places for them to function. Um, right now the Houthis have made almost a parallel ministry of a planning that oversights organizations, that monitors them. You have to have someone, you have to submit parts of your review news um, to the, un un unlegally and unconstitutionally to the Houthi, uh, what they call it, Mushraf, or to the Houthi representative. You have to actually also um, even have some, recently they've started to force them to have people in their tenders from the Houthi representatives when they have tenders. Um, when they actually even um, have tried, forced them to employ a few people every now and then. That is an extremely difficult situation in Sana'a. Sana'a used to have 22 newspapers. We used to have four weekly English newspapers, more than Lebanon. Lebanon, they only have one. Um, <coughs> and now there is 18 newspapers. All of them are full-time Houthi or a part-time Houthi. No other ally actually, no other voice or no other color is allowed, allowed in the country, especially since uh, the bloody end of their very traditional uh, marriage with Saleh uh, recently last year. Um, the fourth point that probably should or, or, or maybe needs to be looked at is the currency exchange. Um, it has lost, the Yemeni Rials was 2.15 um, and now it's uh, between 4.80 and 4.85. Um, that also is actually even depreciating the value of aid, the value of anything we are doing. And that there is so many things should be done for the Yemeni Rial to stand on its feet again. One of them is that the Central Bank of Yemen has to work as one entity again. Um, there is a new governor, that's a possibility <coughs> if he's open, but that is important even for aid workers, for salaries, and it's important even for fighting money laundry. Um, let alone that the Central Bank in Aden cannot do any job um, alone without the Central Bank in Sana'a. All of Yemen's financial infrastructure are in Sana'a. You have 14 of the 15 headquarters of Yemeni banks actually exist in, in Sana'a. And most of the documents of the central bank, as Byzantinian as it is, are actually in paper and are actually in Sana'a. Um, and that's, again, why the decision to reallocate the bank was probably won the prize as of the most stupid decision in Yemen the last five decades um, of, of overall. Either ways, and then my last point about, I think, what would be important to look into Yemen um, is uh, unfortunately, yes, the UN says there is 10,000 people have been killed. Our estimation is at least 50,000 people have been killed in this war. 
the UN numbers are so underestimating of the crisis in Yemen for many reasons. Um, but in, in Marib alone, I counted over 7,000, in one cemetery in Marib, I counted over 7,000 people have been killed in one cemetery. Um, in Sana'a, I bet you there is a probably double that number. But this is not as, as the, the crisis in a way is worse than actually um, what it seems. Um, and, and even the IDPs, the UN calculates how many people move to schools or move to uh, these institutional IDPs. But Yemen is actually moved to their cousins. And there is no way you can count that. Um, and that's one reason you also haven't seen a lot of refugees, is we move within Yemen. We don't move outside. Um, and, and we don't move outside Yemen in, in, in the long term. Um, this is probably, and I can go back later on to look into, uh, 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 you know, look into any of these issues or anything you case, but if you want, we can also uh, start on Hudaida and talk a bit about it uh, before that. Um, Hudaida is not the end of the history, neither the end of the Houthis, um, if you think it will be. There seems to be a green slash yellow international light, but it's a light for the coalition to go with it um, since the last, uh, for the first time since the last, um, since there has been conversation about it going for two years, but apparently now it's going on for many reasons, including the Houthis a threat to actually cut the international trade in, um, in, 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 uh, in the Red Sea. The problem of Hudayda is there is this myth that if you can take the Houthis out of Hudayda, they will go to negotiations. Um, there was the problem with this logic slash illusion is it was the same in Aden two years ago. They said if there was the Houthis get out of Aden, then they will negotiate. And the other problem with that is usually for this sort of assumption to function, um, usually the one who has the power or the one who's the stronger actually makes that compromise. And usually in Yemen's war, and I guess in the region's war, anyone who usually have the upper hand immediately gets the credit of the less wisdom. Um, and that is hard from a conflict resolution point of view to mediate in, in the next term. Hudayda constitutes 20, Hudayda port is 27% of the Houthis budget, um, which quite a lot it seems, but actually they make 29% of their budget from the revenues of the black economy in cooperation with the Yemeni government um, and with, with sites in the different sites of the Yemeni government actually in Riyadh and inside Riyadh. Hudayda is, is right now, the Houthis look into it as their Leningrad. Uh, they're going to fight it to death. Um, this is going to cut their uh, last uh, enter to the sea, um, and it's gonna. Um, it's also uh, significant for them beside the port, I think, because it is an entrance from the coalition into important section of northern Yemen. The Houthis, however, did not lose Hudaida now, or would not lose it now. I think the Houthis lost to Hudaida when they killed Saleh. Um, Saleh actually was their only presence in the non-Zaidi historical areas around Yemen, um, outside Sana'a, outside Hajja. Uh, and when they killed Saleh, they basically became naked without any clothes um, in, in very important parts of Yemen. And that's one reason, again, despite a very, very bloody cost, I assume will happen on the road to Hudaydah. That's why they're able to make some progress there. Or if they will be able, it will be because um, of that reason or of these things. Hudaydah also, there is an important urgency to the port there in matter of uh, bringing goods, bringing aid. But that's why I said that the situation in Sana'a will be different. In, not right now, there is good, but there is no money to buy this food. Um, soon there will be no food, even if you have money, because most of the food comes through Hudayda. And even, one, there is no guarantee that the, the port will not be destroyed. Two, even if the port is not destroyed, it will take a few weeks for life to function again in the, in the transformation um, of, of basically making that a place work, um, uh, uh, work alone. And therefore, that's why I, I, I insist that the coalition is risking in Yemen's Aleppo by unthoughtfully going that much into, um, into Hudaydah. There are three things, at least as a matter of damage control, the coalition should be doing in the Yemeni government um, in to, to, to uh, uh, mediate the, the consequences of Hudaydah port. One is actually open Makha port. If you look to the, if you look to the Makha port, um, it's 40 to 60 kilometers, I think, outside um, uh, Hudaydah. And that port, actually, if you activated that port long time, you would have already paralyzed Hudayda port, actually, and made it irrelevant and won that battle, actually, uh, or made Hudayda so problematic and so consuming rather than source of revenues for the Houthis long time ago. We emphasize the Mokha port is under the control of UAE. It has been so on for a year. Even the governor of Ta'iz said he cannot enter that port uh, to the San'a center recently, uh, the former governor in, in, of Ta'iz. And that port, again, 
can actually serve as an important alternative to a certain point. Yes, it cannot take some of the wheat, it cannot take some uh, uh, specific goods, but more or less it can be a good uh, replacement. There must be an important uh, and immediate opening of Sana'a Airport. Uh, that's, that collective punishment um, is also and, 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 and is going to get harder for people and for goods and for aid workers after Hudaydah is shut down in, in, the, in, in the short term. And that, the, the Sana'a Airport must be opened immediately. And the third, uh, before my last point on Hudaydah specifically, uh, uh, is there should be uh, immediately, always the, the government a claim when they said that they don't pay salaries for areas under the Houthis control, which is a war crime, um, that actually the Yemeni uh, pres uh, prime minister have said on, a, on a Twitter publicly, I will only pay salaries to the areas under my control, which is a war crime before he deleted that tweet. Um, either way, they have always, their excuse has been, is the Houthis submit the revenues and we will pay the salaries. Um, that stupid question of the hen versus the egg, which comes first. Um, the question or the answer now is, you got the port, you got the revenues, here you go, you need to start doing your job and actually pay the salaries of 1.2 million people, which is again more important. And finally, and why I'm a bit skeptical of Hudaydah's battle, is um, there is a more significant battle that can happen and can make a military difference, and that's actually Ta'iz in the middle of Yemen. It has suffered more than um, it has suffered more than Hudaydah, and tactically, militarily, and humanitarily, it's actually s smoother and easier than Hudaydah battle. But again, because Yemen war is no more about Yemen, and is no more about Yemenis, even if it started, there is a lot of confusion and a lot of uh, manipulation in, this, um, in these battles that happens on the ground. I think I've gone above my time a little <laughs> bit, but I'll, 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 give it, uh, I'll give it back to you, and then I can come back later. But thank you very much. Thank you, Faria. Um, and uh, uh, since uh, since we're launched on to the to the conversation about Hodeida, uh, uh, let me. Um, I, I want to do two things. One, I want to turn to Basma um, because one of the issues uh, that that you touched on and and that has uh, uh, consumed a lot of attention here in Washington and, and around the world is the potential impact of the loss of Hodeida port on um, supplies, uh, keeping in mind, of course, that humanitarian supplies into Hodeida are only a part of uh, the, uh, the importance of that port, and commercial supplies uh, coming in are equally important. Uh, it has certainly been argued to me that one of the issues driving uh, the, uh, uh, the coalition decision to, to go after Hodeida is the fact that the Houthis uh, were not allowing commercial supplies to come in or only allowing commercial supplies to come in that suited their purposes. Now, I agree with you that uh, they were not using Hodeida to import weapons. That no. makes no sense. They were getting the weapons other ways. Yep. Uh, but um, they were uh, certainly discriminating in terms of the supplies that they allowed to come in. Uh, as you said, they were uh, deriving a significant amount of their income. Uh, uh, Peter Salisbury's figure yep. was $30 million a month. Uh, which, uh, you know, $350, $360 million a year is a significant portion of their uh, finances, as, as you noted. But I wanted to ask Basma, because we had this conversation some months ago uh, of uh, the coalition saying, but if we don't have Hodato, uh, you can bring in uh, goods through Jazan, you can bring in goods through Aden, you can bring in goods uh, perhaps through Makala or Mocha. Uh, but the argument back was, yes, you can, but the amount that you could do from these more distant ports would be much more uh, restricted, uh, expenses much higher uh, to use alternatives to Hodeida. Uh, what, is, what is the international NGO community thinking about, for example, Faria's suggestion that Mocha would be an alternative port of entry? So I think... Admittedly, we haven't really explored that. I think we're really focused on Hodeida port just because of its capacity, its existing capacity to, to sustain, to allow um, multiple vessels to berth and dock um, in, in the port. You know, Hodeida historically is, a, you know, takes about 80% of the, the country's commercial imports. 
that you know Yemen is relying on 90% of you know is relying on imports for 90% of the goods that come in. So with Hodeida constituting 80%, that's a significant amount. Um, I think just the location, as you mentioned, Ambassador Firestein, the location of Hodeida is very strategic um, for international humanitarian organizations. What we try to do for our work is pro procure locally so that we don't impact the local market. But at the same time, as prices continue to increase in country, our ability to procure as many goods um, or with the quantity that is required to meet the, the significant needs has diminished significantly. And we're having to, to try to rely on some uh, humanitarian imports like WFP vessels that bring in wheat or you know corn or what have you. So I think in terms of Mocha, we haven't really looked at that just because of the historical significance of Hodeida. I mean, Adan port was also an option that was floated um, a, a few months away, uh, ago. And in term, you know, for us, when we looked at that, Adan is much farther from Hodeida. Uh, yeah, from, sorry, from, the, from Sana'a. Um, the amount of checkpoints that you have to go through um, to be able to bring in a convoy of goods, you have to go through immense bureaucratic um, processes to try to deconflict humanitarian convoys, and those require you know you providing the coalition with the exact dates, exact times, and if something doesn't go as planned, which is often the case in Yemen and in other <laughs> conflict uh, zones, that means you have to reapply from you know from start from the first reapply completely and basically have to start a new application, which further delays our ability to deliver, deliver the much needed goods um, for these populations. Okay, thanks. Faria, let me, let me come back um, uh, to you and, and ask, and, and we were talking about this a little while ago. Uh, you had made the point uh, uh, earlier that um, Yemenis are famous not only for fighting, uh, for which they are justifiably famous, uh, but also for um, a, a certain level of pragmatism mm. in terms of their ability, their willingness to enter into mediation, and if not resolve their issues, at least paper over them. Mm. Uh, and of course, um, one of the things that strikes me as I, as I study um, the history of Yemen more closely, and particularly um, the last 60 or 70 years, is that we have had a series of violent eruptions over the mm. years. Practically every 10 years, there is an explosion of some sort or another. Um, all of which are imperfectly resolved, yeah. uh, in the sense that the fighting is ended, even if the core issues are never really addressed. And I think that that, if I, if I go back and look at what happened in 2011, 2012, that's precisely uh, what, what happened, yeah. that, that the, um, there was a pragmatic decision on the side of all of the parties to paper over their differences, put together a piece of paper with the help of the international community, uh, but then when it got actually to the point of resolving the, the real core issues, north-south, Houthis, uh, economy, government, uh, all of those things, um, uh, that was all kind of shoved to the side. Yeah. But, but it does seem that um, for whatever reason, and perhaps it's because of the role of the international community here, the ability of Yemenis to make these pragmatic decisions and to say, um, we're going to have to stop fighting now uh, and, yeah. and figure out how to go forward, that's been lost. Uh, uh, people, you know, uh, w when I was when I was working uh, on these issues in 2011, uh, there would be times where we would be talking to the parties, uh, and they would get agitated about something or other, whatever it was, and they would say, "Well, I'm not going to talk to that person yeah. anymore. I, that person is yeah. dead to me." Yeah. And you have to pass messages back and forth, and we would kind of run back and forth and pass messages. And then find out that while we were doing that, about one or two o'clock in the morning, these guys were on the telephone <laughs> talking to one another. Um, why is that not happening? Mm. Uh, for many reasons. Uh, one, because yes, this war is in Yemen, on Yemen, 
under the name of Yemen, but it's no more about Yemen. Mm. This is no more a Yemeni war, whether we like it or we don't like it. Um, this is a part of Yemen now is a small piece in a larger regional uh, proxy and in a larger uh, regional uh, fight. Um, that's one reason. Um, and there seems to be, again, uh, an, always an, uh, an ability of Yemen is not just to, uh, uh, to solve the problems, but even when there is a foreigner willing to pay to be his contractors. They do that very well, both sides and every side in Yemen. Um, and that's, I think, the main issue is right now is one that is the outside. This is like nowhere we have ever seen. You have 18 countries, you have everyone against everyone, you have, you have a flow of cash, a flow of money, flow of fighters, something we haven't seen in our entire life. We haven't seen in Yemen like this. Um, and the second part is also locally, not just regionally. For the first time in our history, everyone is really part of the problem. Hmm? In 2011, the GCC was not part of the problem even if theoretically was minus Qatar, actually, by that time. Mm -hmm. um, so the Gulf countries came together and said, OK, we're going to be an umbrella of peace in Yemen. And they did that because they were not part of the problem. The only problem was Qatar, and they excluded it from the GCC deal. And then those who were not part actually came and invested in peace. I think that's the most important right now. And this is what the Gulf really lost when they went into war in Yemen, their ability to be an outsider to be someone from outside these fights and the zones. When you go to fight, to a war, um, you lose your ability to be a mediator. And I think that's one thing they lost. Um, and then, because this is also the war in Yemen, is not, a, you know, depending on which side you take, you will get it back to a time frame. Um, you know, whether it's September 21st or March 25th or uh, 2011. But as you mentioned very correctly, there are structural problems that actually ultimately bring this war. And no matter even if we sign the best peace deal in the world, um, these problems will be there. And as long as we don't solve them, this, this war will come again. What you had in this war is almost like a sewage system. You opened it up on all of this annoying stuff that had been there for 50 years and that smelled bad and are actually incorrect, basically came to the surface. It's not that they came from out nowhere. And also, the, even the way of the budget of Yemeni, if Yemeni government was set, you had for example, one entity uh, at the Ministry of Defense, one department, it was equal to the budget of 12 ministries, including health education, higher education, technical education, the Marines, one department. So you had the whole policy and political decision, regional and most importantly local, to bring the new generation of fighters ah, and to prepare Yemen for fight. Um, mm -hmm. When you look to this even weapons right now being fired at Saudi or even being used in the conflict, these are wars that Saudis and the Gulf have paid for in Yemen for the last 50 years. Yes. And, and this, is, this, is war being, this is weapons being used. So everyone's investment in Yemen was, was, done be, uh, was there. But I would go again to another problem, I think, larger than Yemen, which is the architect of diplomacy being set around conflict resolution is a problematic and is a fraud. Um, the last three years, you and the process in Yemen was a process to manage Yemen conflict, not to solve Yemen's conflict. And there is a big difference. And that's why Ismail al Sheikh was even appointed for his inabilities more than for his abilities. The job was to actually mediate Yemen, you know, manage Yemen conflict, not solve Yemen conflict. We had also at one point, some got a creative. They brought the Quad, but it was faulty and it didn't finish. And there was the problem with the Quad was they kept saying Iran is part of the problem. Uh, you go back to Iran and you say, why don't you bring Iran to the Quad if it's part of the problem and negotiate with Iran? They say, no, 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 but we're not going to talk to Iran. But you say Iran is part of the problem. You go to the Iranians on the other side and you say, you know, you need to stop supporting the Houthis, especially now when they are with the nuclear deal. And the Houthis and the Iranians until recently would go back and say, the Houthis, how do you spell that? Um, we don't know them. I mean, they denied any knowledge on them. And that architect of diplomacy, everyone was talking to whoever have no problem and whoever have no solution in many ways. And I think, again, the set and the types of conflict we face in Yemen, in Syria, in Libya, do not you, you can't put them under you in the framework and you in the process. And you know this better than me. In 2011, what solved the crisis was not the you in the process. Even if later on it was given the you in the hat and the you in the process or the you in the credentials. We need, for Yemen, for Syria, for Libya, we need new processes of peace. One that benefit from, for example, looks not into you in modus, but looks into FARC in Colombia. Um, if you look to the FARC agreement in Colombia, which is very creative, over 200 pages. Um, that goes into every detail of the problem, really, and responds to it, and demonstrates an actual commitment to peace, uh, and that they discussed peace. Now you have the GCC deal. 
or you have the unification uh, agreement in 1994 or in 1990 or the B4 war agreement in Yemen in 1994. All of these peace agreements are two pages, shorter than a marriage document. Two pages, huh? and you expect them to solve all of the processes. But again, the UN cannot get too long. These processes cannot get too long. We need, again, a piece of process that looks into FARC and from our region point of view, looks, for example, into Taif Agreement in Lebanon, which I find as a conflict resolution a pretty fabulous, actually. And that's the difference between it and the GCC deal. In 1990, you had an agreement in Lebanon that ended the civil war. In 2011, you had an agreement in Yemen that started the civil war. It's a quite uh, problematic in the sense of how it was said. So again, I would go back to the art of diplomacy, to the problems of the local sites, to the payments, to some countries also in the region investing in wars. Um, and I think this is a larger issue than Yemen uh, by itself. Well, <laughs> what I would say, um, you're, you're absolutely right. In the in in the point, and I think that that one of the things that 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 occurs to me about all of this is that if we try to solve everything now, we'll solve nothing. Yep. Um, that that the um, you have to take this in bite-sized pieces. Uh, what the UN is trying to do now, I think correctly, is to stop the war, stop yep. the fighting. You're not going to get anything done until you can stop the bombs from falling and, and the shelling from taking place. You can get the economy going again, which is absolutely essential. Um, you can get some kind of governance established that can actually provide some structures, health and education and the other basic services to the country. Um, you, the UN can do those things. Yes. They can't do the bigger piece that you're talking about. Um, only Yemenis can do that, and I, and I think that this is the, the key. Now, you're right, the GCC initiative was a relatively short document. It's got the implementing mechanism, which yes. is True. how Jamal bin True. Omar earned his salary for all those months. <laughs> um, uh, so you had that, but the important thing in the, in the GCC initiative was not that, it was a national dialogue conference. Uh. And you had you had 1,600 or 1,800 recommendations that came yeah. out of the uh, out of the uh, national dialogue conference. I think most of them were good. Maybe some of them were bad. Yep. Uh, what you didn't have was an implementation mechanism to say, okay, we've agreed to do this. Yeah. Uh, now, how are we going to go about actually doing it and making sure that the people who yes. agreed to it were uh, uh, own the process of implementation. Yes. Uh, and, and that's where we failed, I think, that's where Yemenis failed, um, was, to, was to take the next step of actually saying, well, here's the blueprint, now we're going to build the building. Hmm. Um, and so the question is, how do you go back to that? Now, on the Iranians, um, I would say, and, and if you remember, uh, John Kerry actually uh, sat down with Zarif, yeah. in Lausanne and talked to him about Yemen. And uh, Kerry, uh, you know, gave a, um, you know, a, a sense to, to Zarif about what he thought would be a reasonable resolution of the, of the Yemen conflict. Zarif has said subsequently that he um, uh, agreed with Kerry uh, and that if, if there were uh, a revival of the Kerry initiative, if you will, that the Iranians would buy into it. The problem I have with the Iranians, of course, is that Javed Zarif is a perfectly wonderful guy, speaks fabulous English, yeah. uh, knows Americans better than most Americans know Americans, uh, but does not speak for the part of the Iranian government yeah. that actually yeah. is calling the shots in Yemen, uh, which is the IRGC, it's Qasem Soleimani, yes. it's Jafri, uh, and those guys, I think, are perfectly happy to see the Yemen yes. conflict go on forever. And contrary to Yemen, in, in, uh, contrary to Syria or Iraq or Lebanon, for example, on Yemen, in Iran, there is two sides. There is the Zarif Rouhani uh, camp, mm -hmm. which is the cool side, the mm -hmm. one that says, if Yemen, packing off from Yemen is the price for us to keep the nuclear deal, let's do that. Um, mm -hmm. and, and actually, is, is 
I, for them, Yemen is not a big incentive. Mm -hmm. It's not, you know, if you ask them to behave in Iraq or in Lebanon or in Syria, they are not, not on the dead body and not on the dead Iran deal. Mm -hmm. But if you ask them about Yemen, they will give it a thought, and that's one side within it. Um, the second side is what you're saying about Qasem Soleimani, Khomeini, and this side is more, had this theological myth of the Shia crescent that will come all the way from Yemen um, and the way in, 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 uh, from, uh, you know, from Syria and Lebanon. The problem is the war empowered the second camp. On mm -hmm. the expense of Khamen, uh, 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 Zarif, Zarif uh, Rouhani camp on side of him, it actually made them um, have more legit, but all have more legitimacy within Iran and within Yemen's decision making. However, there is also a serious uh, issue that, I mean, Iran got nothing to lose in Yemen, contrary to Saudi, which Yemen is a domestic affair for them. Mm -hmm. It's not a, a foreign affairs. It's a domestic mm -hmm. province, and that's how they look into it. But also, the Houthis and uh, is not Hezbollah. Hmm? Uh, you right. hear all the government, you hear the uh, Saudis say the Houthis are Hezbollah, and I wish they were Hezbollah. This is the biggest compliment you can ever give to the Houthis. I mean, Hezbollah understands politics, have been there for 25 years, they hijack the state, they don't destroy it, and their number one ally is the hardcore Maronite Christian. I mean, this is, this is the, a lot of wishful thinking. The government and the Saudis don't know they're actually doing them VR in that sense, to, to, the, to the Houthis by saying they're Hezbollah. So that's also a different context. And then Hezbollah is fighting Israel because they think it's enemy. Houthis are fighting Saudis because they're looking for attention, huh? right. because they're looking for a friendship. <laughs> this is very. Uh, they're looking for a good deal. Uh, they would. I mean, this will be. Yeah. This is why the Houthis are in a war with the Saudis because they couldn't find a way to be friends yeah. yet. Um, and I think that that's a, that plays a significant uh, role. Sure, if the Saudis, right. you know, just add the Houthis to their payroll, I bet you tomorrow they will be the ones, um, you know, defending Saudi borders from Iraq. Actually, when that war starts. But the Saudis didn't, I mean, the Saudis have offered it. They haven't said yes yet. Yeah, yeah the Houthis have offered it. <laughs> uh, no, the Saudis offered it to the Houthis. The Houthis, uh, so far, I, I don't think we've re arrived at the price. Mm. Uh, uh, Basma, I, I, what, what's, uh, taking off your Norwegian Refugee Council hat for a moment and, and speaking as a, uh, as a young Yemeni woman. Syrian. Uh, <laughs> I'm Syrian, not Yemeni. Oh, oh uh, yeah. well, but as somebody who knows Yemen. Yeah. Um, What's your thought? What's the way forward? I mean, it's tough for me to really take off my Norwegian refugee <laughs> council hat just because it, it does speak to, to my core beliefs in terms of what we do there. Um, going to Yemen as a Syrian was really profound for me because I'm not allowed to go to Syria. Um, I did live in Yemen as a child. Um, mm. So it was the closest I could go to, to home country. Mm. And going there and really seeing the impact um, on civilians made me just, you know, living through the airstrikes just took me, you know, put the, the idea of, you know, Syrians living under barrel bombs in, in reality, basically, and kind of put that perspective that I could have only imagined sitting in Washington and mm -hmm. not having visited these two places until um, mid-April. But it also was very clear the way that civilians are really used as, as pawns in these conflicts, you know? They're the ones that pay the worst price. They're the ones that really experience the most, endure the most, and at the same time, you know, being in Washington and seeing the, the, the political will or the lack thereof sometimes and trying to get civilians um, to improve the conditions for civilians was really frustrating as well. I mean, in Syria, it's been eight years since the conflict. I think civilians have definitely, you know, undisputably like paid the heaviest price. And I think in Yemen, we're seeing three years in the conflict and civilians are still paying the heaviest price. And I think, you know, if, if the US doesn't do anything about it, they're still gonna continue paying the heaviest price. I mean, we saw it from my work at NRC. I mean, mm -hmm. with the blockade in, in November, uh, you know, a small, you know, message from President Trump and you get a 30-day lift on the blockade. Now, I don't think, at least throughout our work since, you know, December, we haven't seen a complete lift of the blockade. Mm -hmm. There's still complete, you know, there, there's still impediments. Um, and there was a de facto blockade that were, that were you know, hindering the, the flow of commercial goods and fuel. Last, last month, you had 37% of the minimum requirement <coughs> of fuel um, delivered through Hodeidah. 
th these are all essential goods that really only help the civilians survive. Mm -hmm. They're being manipulated by the political parties. I think all parties are definitely at fault, but I think if there's anyone to really stand up and really bring peace to the table, I think the US and the UK have a huge role. And I, I think for Syria, it might be too late, but I, I don't think so for Yemen. Mm -hmm. I think there's still hope. Well, I'd certainly like to see um, uh, Secretary Pompeo take more of the kind of role that Secretary Kerry played yeah. uh, in 2016. <clears throat> um, it was unfortunate that uh, uh, when uh, Rex Tillerson was there, he, he more or less um, walked away from the issue. But um, let's, uh, let's give people in the audience uh, an opportunity to, to ask questions. Um, uh, Nigel, we have micro, uh, microphones or? Okay, so. Um, uh, uh, let's, uh, this gentleman here, and uh, please wait uh, for the microphone and identify yourself. Thank you. Uh, my name is Nicholas Brumfield. I'm from uh, Tesla Government. Um, I had a question for Basma, but it's really open for the entire panel. Um, specifically, given um, NRC's work in governance all over the country, I really appreciated the picture you were able to draw for you know, a civil servant family and sort of urban sana, but I was wondering if you could um, elaborate a little bit about how you know, the dynamics of scarcity and the blockade play out in more rural areas given uh, Yemen's predominantly rural population, um, does having sort of a bit of agricultural land in sort of rural um, you know, familial networks mediate that in any way or is there different challenges that they face? Yeah, let's start with Basma okay. and then... No, no, I mean, take around the question. Oh, no, we'll, we'll yeah. do one at a time for... Okay. Yeah, um, yeah we'll I mean, the reason I mentioned civil servants was because they're the privileged or the, the more, um, the luckier ones in, in, uh, in Yemeni society. As you mentioned correctly, I mean, I think the rural areas have really been the ones that were impacted the most by the scarcity. In Sana'a, you do see some goods. You do, you do see some availability of, of products, but in the rural areas, I think they're the ones that are really experiencing what, you know, as, as true famine is really like. Um, I think most of, the, most of the people that NRC tries to serve are either people that have fled the rural areas and have come to, to Sana'a or Adan um, or any of the larger cities um, in seek of assistance, but we're also trying to, to expand our reach into accessing these populations. But I mean, similar to what Fadi mentioned um, when, in, when he first started, our, our impediments are just continuing to grow. Um, I mean, the obstacles of operating and the obstacles of trying to access these populations are increasingly becoming very, very difficult, making our job that much harder and trying to cater to people that are not, you know, seen or as accessible as the populations in, um, in major cities. Okay. Um, so, uh, back here. Hi, uh, Gregory Johnson, the Arabia Foundation. Uh, Hi, Gregory Johnson, the Arabia Foundation. Um, my question is basically, the war's been going on for four years, 2016, 2017, a stalemate. The UN's on its third special envoy and as many in, in four years. So how does this war end? And when it does end, is there any way that Yemen can be put back together again? We've talked about a lot. We haven't talked about the Southern Transition Council. Some of the things, Farah, you talked about, um, three different Yemens that you saw on your trip to Hadramut. So, so those are the two questions. How does it end, and can you put it back together again when it eventually does end? Oh, um, I, I mean, you should answer how does it end, because you held it in 2011, <laughs> not me. Uh, but I'll, 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 I'll talk to the second one, with how do you put it back together as it was? You don't. Um, you actually cannot, even if you want, put Yemen in the way you imagine it. Uh, one central state, one thing, that is gone. Huh? That, is, that illusion was in the, hands of, in the head of Saleh and it costed him his life, that he thought he can make Sana'a central again and actually can undo the revolution and undo the consequences with all of its bad and goods, and it costed his life, so you shouldn't try thinking about that. Um, but I think, to overall, 
and this was also partially the Houthis reason or motive for the war is the, that now there is a big myth of federalism and it seems the trend happening in the country. Whether it's a good idea or a bad idea, we cannot back off from it. It was already oversold as the savior Jesus Christ. It was sold, sold in, in, in national dialogue conference and so on. What you can do, I think, is redefine it to, ha to make it a thoughtful process so that you achieve the soul or you achieve the contest of no one rules the other. Sana'a cannot, you cannot, if you need a passport in Adan, go all the way to Sana'a. That needs to be over. And that's already over. In Marib, there is a federalism stamped by blood. People will not back up from it um, in these parts of the country. So you see what already structures are there, of course, while keeping Yemen. You know, think of Yemen like MSF. Um, you know, there are three or four different organizations, but for the better of the world and for their better, they have to coordinate. Mm -hmm. And that will all more or less be the Yemen we imagine in, in the coming phase. Is one, again, um, I insist on the idea where um, no, no more center, that's impossible even if you want. But most importantly is the South, which I remain to think is the number one problem facing Yemen, since it is shaping Yemen or can reshape the way we know Yemen and the way this country is, has existed. What you do with that uh, part of the country, in, in my own thought, is you definitely give them beyond their demographical representation in power and in resources for two main reasons. One, uh, they had a state in the past, they had more grievances after it, and now they have more guns, basically. Um, and you need to deal with that in a way or another. That will be the way with it. But again, to have a one center, a one place, I think does not really, um, uh, really anymore uh, is, is the question, I guess, into, if you can take the first one. Yeah, I, I would just say, um, uh, again, uh, I, I think that you have to take it at, in stages. And, and the first stage has to be uh, this UN process of stopping the fighting and, and establishing some kind of of stability, peace inside the country so that people can work on some of these deeper issues. Uh, interestingly, and you know this, Greg, um, mm -hmm. if you go back, if you look at the document of peace and accord in 1994, if you look at the outcomes of the National Dialogue Conference in 2014, if you look at the various iterations of mediation uh, ending the, uh, the, the Saada Wars mm -hmm. in the 2000s, all of them contain the same basic elements. It's uh, decentralization, um, you know, uh, whether you call it a federal state or, or how you do it. Uh, it's pushing autonomy down to a local level, giving people more of a sense of control over their lives. Uh, it is, um, uh, you know, allowing people greater power and authority to choose uh, their representatives. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that uh, Claire Lockhart and her mm -hmm. uh, Institute for State Effectiveness uh, is working on this idea of a bottom-up approach to, um, uh, to decentralization, empowering local communities to, and, and rather than starting at the top and, and pushing down, you start at the bottom and push up. Uh, that may be an approach. But the, the, but the, the failure, I think, that, that we've witnessed over the years in Yemen isn't the failure to understand what the solutions are to the problems. Uh, I think that the solutions are well understood and they've been identified over and over and over again. The failure has come in that the people have not actually established the mechanisms to achieve the solutions that everybody agreed had to be resolved. So you, in 1994, you signed the document of peace and accord, and then uh, 10 days later, uh, the civil war started. In, in 2014, you came up with 1,600 recommendations in the National Dialogue Conference, 500 people working for a full year, uh, working through these issues, coming up with what I believe are perfectly sensible solutions, but three months later, the Houthis uh, um, uh, attacked Sana'a and uh, destroyed the government. So that, that's where the problem is. And until you get past that, until you have the Yemeni people saying, these are the solutions, we want these solutions, and now we want our leadership to actually achieve it, you're going to have these periodic. And, uh, and one of the things that, you know, and I, and I agree with uh, Faria and, and Basma in the sense that what's happening now is particularly dire, is particularly catastrophic for Yemen, but it's not unique. In 1986 in Aden, you had 10,000 people killed in 10 days of fighting. 
Uh, um, you've had the, the Six Sod Wars in the 2000s. You've had these periodic explosions because people have not implemented the, uh, the solutions that they all understood needed to be um, implemented. And on, on matter of the peace, to your point, on matter of the peace exactly, is it's not how do we bring, how do we end this. I think before that, we need to take a decision to end it. Hmm. That decision to end the Yemen war is not there yet, neither regionally nor internationally. Look, there was more effort and more diplomacy, including in this country, to buy a ticket home for Saad al-Hariri than there was about the worst humanitarian crisis in modern history. If you had to half of what you did to buy a ticket to Saad al-Hariri and then we fell, I'll tell you, let's do a lesson slide. But there has been an absolute commitment to war in Yemen, um, of, on all levels, and zero commitment to peace. Um, and that's, that's a serious issue. If we have that decision, then we will call, talk about details. Here is a triangle in, of peace. Number one of the triangle is Saudi-Iranian understanding. And Saudi-Iranian understanding, not about the region. That will never happen, but about Yemen, specifically. Then we come back to the second angle of the triangle, and we say, that's the UN process. You solve the problem between Hadi and the Houthis. Then we come to the third angle of the problem, which is what Yemenis really care about, the problems of Yemenis, which is different from all of these two different sides of the anchors that will go into development, into economy, and into decentralization, and stuff people really care um, about. But I don't think yet we are, we have decided peace. Um, in yet when that decision is taken, and it can be taken here for simple reason, for America's problems rather than for America's good. Um, right now they have a very good relation with the Saudis, and that makes the Saudis and the coalition feel comfortable if they hear, if they're pushed by America, um, especially with this administration. From a conflict resolution point of view, it's the closest you can ever get into solving the Yemen conflict, actually. Again, because the Saudis listen to them mm -hmm. and because the Saudis care about them and they don't feel threatened um, or being uh, as, as, in the march, uh, as in the past or in the last days of, of Obama. I think if the current sec state secretary takes John Kerry plan, which is the closest we ever have gotten into peace in Yemen, it will go very smooth. Um, and it will not actually, and it will actually have a bigger shot than even the UN process at the moment. Yes. Hi, my name is Victoria. I'm with the International Center for Religion and Diplomacy here in DC. And my question is for both of you. Having actually worked on the ground in Yemen, um, what's your opinion on the role of, or the role or capacity of religious actors in Yemen to empower the community, um, contribute towards community resilience, or perhaps reach these less successful populations that you were talking about? And yeah, what's, what's your opinion on the capacity for religious actors? I mean, I didn't personally engage very much with religious actors, but again, if I can just plug in from like my Syrian background, I mean, I didn't get the sense that it was as polarized as it is in Syria. It's, I didn't feel like it was a sectarian conflict or a conflict driven by religion. Um, so I think, yeah, that's the extent that I can speak to. Yeah, I agree. Okay, back here. Hello, my name is Kevin Alvarado. Oh. Uh, I had the honor of serving in Yemen back in the early 90s. Do you want to give a mic? Yeah. Hear me now? Yeah. My name is Ken, Ken Audrey. I sir, I was a far, former Foreign Service officer. I had the honor of serving in Yemen in the early 1980s, in bad old days, in Sana'a. And I remember predicting at the time that I thought unity was not in the cards. I, I saw a lot of obstacles to the unification of Yemen, uh, not least the uh, sectarian one and the secular, the secular character of the Aden area of Pidri. But at the same time, we viewed the Zaidi, that is the main Shia group that controlled the north as being the most reasonable and what shall I say, the closest to Sunnis of all the Zaidi sects. So I was quite surprised when the civil war broke out and I wondered if you had, have, you, have I missed this or have you already addressed the, the root cause of the civil war? I mean, just, you just said that you didn't think it was, oh, I'm sorry, she said that she thought it wasn't sectarianism. Um, 
maybe it's the the fact that the country is so lacks infrastructure and the, and that there is so much power located in the, on the outskirts and in the, the towns. But what is the root cause of this horrible thing, mess? Besides the outside involvement you pointed at. Thank you, sir. I mean, I wasn't born in the 80s. You probably <laughs> did not know, know more than me on that. I, I think, uh, so I mean, I, I can't, I, I would talk about two things in, in you mentioned. One about the Zaydism. For those who, you're correct, it's a reasonable, rational doctrine, even if the Houthis are actually taking it a little bit more radical. But you're correct, that's one of the most uh, open, actually, uh, uh, schools of Islam. As you even cannot be a mufti until you study the ration and you study linguistics and you study what philosophers usually go through to be a licensed philosopher if there is a one of them. Um, Zaydism, if you dig deep inside, is actually the biggest threat to Iran uh, because it is the only non 12 Shia version of Shia Islam. Huh? And that's actually minus very minor group, which is uh, uh, Jarudiyya. It's actually a pretty uh, rational, a pretty open uh, uh, school of Islam. And it's again, it is an extreme threat to Iran because it is a Shia that is not a 12 um, and that, that's not things that actually Iranians deep inside like. Deep inside the Houthis, they actually look to the Iranians as their proxy, not the opposite in, 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 their, uh, in their nights, I think, when they're, when they're, uh, when they're dreaming. Um, there are so many roots of this cause, of this war. I would call one of them, which is there is an illusion every other decade by someone that they can rule Yemen alone and they can rule it by force. Hmm? And that has always knocked everyone who had that illusion. Um, that illusion had it Saleh, um, that had illusion have it now the Houthis. At one point, even on a less little, that illusion had he had it um, and his uh, mini team um, in 2013. Um, so every time someone have this illusion again, they take us into 10 years of war. Until we create some sort of a national doctorian that sums up the soul of all Yemenis, we're going to go end up into this illusion every now and then. And that's why I think this war is a stupid idea, even from the coalitions, and because you cannot make a difference in Yemen by force. You cannot. You can make a difference maybe by buying, by corruption, by things. You can run stuff like that. But force in Yemen is not an aspect. You end up bleeding yourself, and you end up bleeding everyone um, around you. That's what the Houthis did. That's what Saleh did. That's what happened in 86. That's what happened in 1994. That's what will happen in 2020, as this seems no one is learning yet. Yeah. Yeah, Yemen is a, it's a classic. It's, a, it's an extractive rentier state um, yeah. uh, where uh, the, po uh, po the political and economic elite um, uh, takes all of the, uh, the assets and uh, prevents uh, uh, anyone else from having access. Uh, feelings of marginalization both in the south and, the, and uh, in the north of the north. And the thing about the, thing about the Houthi movement is, is that even though even though the Houthis are Zayed, uh, are Zaydi, uh, but so are many of the elites in, yep. uh, in Yemen, Zaydi as well. Mm -hmm. They're tribal sheikhs. Uh, but the, the movement, uh, um, even though it started out as a Zaydi movement, attracted popular support from the Shafi'i population as well in the north. Uh, because these were people who felt marginalized, and they and the Zaydi were able, uh, the the uh, the Houthis were able to to build on popular dissatisfaction and frustration uh, with a very populist message, uh, and that's why when they did come into um, into Sanaa in 2014, uh, they were uh, pretty well received by a lot of people who shared uh, with them the anger and frustration, mm -hmm. not only over the, the many decades of Sala rule and, and all of that, but also the failure of the transition yeah. uh, to really address some of the things that people um, took to the streets uh, to protest in 2011. So anyway, just a thought. Yes, uh, gentleman in the blue shirt. Hi, uh, Harrison Kramer, I write for the National Journal. Um, I'm going to come at it from a bit of a different angle just because I cover uh, politics on Capitol Hill. So I'd like to hear from you guys. Um, there have been a number of letters recently. Uh, Mark Pocan, who's a House lawmaker, from um, circulated a, a letter among politicians, got around 30 signatures, 
um, calling for uh, Congress threatening to invoke a war powers resolution on Yemen. Um, another letter was uh, sent out a few days ago among senators, got maybe eight signatures um, uh, calling for similar um, action. What do you think is something that lawmakers need to focus on uh, if they want to make a serious change in Yemen? And secondly, um, how could they pressure either Pompeo or the Pentagon to take their, their concerns more seriously? Free, you were on the Hill this morning. Um, I mean, the simple question is, I don't know uh, the simple answer, because your, your government is so frustrating and so different. Like, you have Congress, you have too many governments in DC. Um, but that's actually the good thing. Uh, about especially the Congress themselves, because it seems that the coalition is completely on the same page, the same page with the White House, but the Congress it still faces some questions, which is quite important. Um, I think uh, there is a, an upcoming vote on the uh, PMG, um, precise uh, big GM, precise guided weapons. The Congress should take a strong stand on that, not because of the idea itself, but uh, because uh, one, it, will, it, it needs to do a leverage. Someone have to tell the Saudis and UAE, at least once a year, you can't get everything you want. And the only one who seems to be able to do it at the moment is the Congress. So as an atmosphere, that's a very important. And two, because the PGM has been a very precise, uh, at a lot of times, but a very precise war crimes. It has been a precise, but it has been, for example, in Sana'a, last month there was the presidential office uh, building uh, that was bombed in the middle of the Sana'a, in a, in a, you know, in, in next to schools and hospitals and populated. That was a very precise, but it was a precise war crime. So the, the, the questions about them has not, has been, you know, uh, the Saudis have gotten more weapons without, uh, and, and the UAE without promising, actually, without delivering their promises in, 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 in respecting more war uh, things. That's the one thing, or the one, the one thing I would call the Congress to actually uh, look at in the upcoming vote. Uh, last time we lost it by four, I think, or five, um, and I hope this time it will be different. The second one is the War Power Act, which also seems to be engaged. Uh, the United States uh, have constantly said that they are not engaged in the war against the Houthis. Uh, to my knowledge, as recent as last week, they have been engaged um, directly in a, by drones. Um, and second of all uh, is there are U.S. contractors in the Hudaida in the ground right now, and uh, they must uh, report legally to anyone, and that must be also the United States, even if they are not a governmental um, entity and even if they're a private uh, organization um, in, in that sense. So that would be, these are two resolutions uh, I think are coming up. Um, I mean, the war power is just, I have to question the OD uh, about exact role it's playing in Yemen, um, since it seems it has had a more free hand than it usually, um, than it usually had. And it was called out in the past various times um, for drone strikes, for example, in Yemen, which remains a problem now, in remains an issue, even worse with raids. But it seems that they have been happy, happier a lot with the journalists busy with the F-16 um, and actually ignoring the drones for now, which there are very few things that could make US drone policy looks like an okay. One of it is the Saudi airstrike. Um, and therefore, they, 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 they shouldn't be lit away. Again, the issues of a drone strike should not, and US involvement in Yemen should be, should be held accountable. And the only entity who can do that is actually the hell. Um, we've been meeting with senators the last few days. Um, seems there isn't, interest here and there, but um, the problem is we don't send refugees to DC, so you don't really worry about Yemen a lot. Um, I mean, and that's quite but, unfortunate, unfortunate, sorry. But I do want to add, I mean, I think I slightly disagree with you in the fact that they, they don't care, because I think Hill, the Hill has really been our go-to ally um, when it comes to Yemen. In terms of advocacy in DC, I think they have been very outspoken. Um, a lot of the public statements and the letters that have been circulated from the Hill have been um, very, you know, they, they've resonated very strongly with what we as the international community are trying to signal. Um, the one thing that I would encourage, uh, you know, congressional members to, to really do and push the administration for is to really push the administration to make public a lot of their, you know, behind closed doors discussions with the Saudis, with the UAE, um, to really make, you know, Hold, hold these, uh, these allies accountable for their actions, especially now as we see more violence escalate around Hadeida. Um, yeah. I think you know, the, the humanitarian catastrophe that will inevitably ensue from, from this, uh, from this um, escalation is, is going to be very, very immense. So I think having the Hill really pushing the administration yeah. into taking a public stance and 
I, I, I think we should be calling out against this, this Hadeda attack. Um, and usually what the administration tells the Congress is we don't have a leverage over the guys, uh, yeah. which is incorrect. You know, if you stop the refueling, you're actually going to paralyze more than half of the Saudi airstrikes in Yemen and the UAE. So there is a small leverage. I'm not saying to lose it, but I'm, or, or to stop it or cut it, but I'm saying make it to a good use, make it to a peace use, and that's a possible. Usually we have had two problems in Yemen. No one can hold the Houthis accountable, ever. They have broken every single agreement they have signed, including the ones that they have forced themselves. And no one can hold the, Houthi, the Saudis also accountable on one, on one side. We have, in matter of the Houthis, I think the Omanis, not the Iranians, not the Russians, can hold them accountable if there is a peace. And I think on matter, of uh, uh, the Saudis, of course, there is only one crown prince who can talk to our crown prince, and that's Jared Kushner, and that should be made <laughs> into use. Vanessa? Vanessa uh, Bruin, yep. Department of State. Uh, this question is for Rian, possibly you, Ambassador Feierstein. Oh. Um, how do you think that the recent events in Hodeida affect the UN Special Envoy's push for peace? Uh, negotiations, and do you think that it has rendered him, Martin Griffiths, completely irrelevant? And mm. what can the U.S. administration do to help make sure those negotiations stay on track? Uh, well, uh, of course, the coalition argument is that um, is that what they're trying to accomplish in Hodeida will strengthen the role of of uh, the special representative because it will force the Houthis to come back to the negotiating table. Uh, I know Faria uh, disagrees with that, uh, with that um, thought. Uh, I think that we don't know, um, yeah. you know, that, that we're going to have to see how this plays out. Um, uh, the, the coalition people say to us, uh, and I assume that they're saying to you as well, uh, that they are um, working closely with Martin Griffiths and that he is okay with their strategy. So um, I think that that's a question to, to put to him. Uh, uh, in, in terms of, um, uh, in terms of, of, you know, what the U.S. can do, uh, I, I do think, and, uh, you know, and I know that, that uh, you know, that Ambassador Tuller has uh, remained engaged and that uh, we saw he was down a matter, of, yep. uh, I guess, the other day. Um, and is doing his best, but I don't think that there is any substitute for the engagement uh, at the most senior levels. Um, I, I'm not sure that yep. Jared Kushner is the answer to anybody's <laughs> prayers, um, uh, but I certainly think that uh, if uh, Secretary Pompeo picked up uh, where uh, John Kerry left off and, and actually um, brought the parties together, uh, and, and, you know, conceivably, I mean, again, uh, you know, I, although I disagreed with some of the aspects of what Secretary Kerry did, I, I don't necessarily think that, that his uh, proposal was, was um, uh, necessarily the right, the right answer, but uh, the fact that he was willing to sit down with the Houthis and work through some of these issues with them, and then uh, also, you know, perhaps to do shuttle diplomacy, get the, the Houthis to come out to Muscat and meet with them mm -hmm. again, I think that, that there is no substitute for having uh, Secretary Pompeo, um, you know, engage in that kind of, of diplomacy. Uh, and the other thing is, you know, we did in the past, um, you know, encourage the Saudis uh, particularly, you know, we, we kind of, I've talked about it a little bit. The, the, the fact of the matter is that, that if we're going to wait for Saudi Arabia and Iran to resolve their, um, their issues uh, in, in Yemen, I think we're going to be waiting a long, long time. Uh, but I, I've never believed that the Houthis are not available to some kind of an yeah. agreement with Saudi Arabia. Uh, we saw, we saw um, uh, in 2016 that there was a lot of positive movement uh, in that direction. Um, a number of things happened in 2016. There was a prisoner exchange. Uh, there was a de facto ceasefire along the Saudi-Yemeni uh, uh, border. Um, uh, the, the Saudis sent a lot of relief uh, supplies into, uh, into Saada. Um, you know, and, and there was, at that particular moment, a lot of optimism that, in fact, uh, the Saudis um, and the Houthis were, were actually coming to some kind of, of resolution. 
And if you were able to do that, it would reduce some of the, the fears and concerns that the Saudis had on their side, uh, as well as give the Houthis maybe some confidence to, to uh, engage in the political process. I think that we should get back to that, uh, and that we should again be uh, working with the Saudis to try to come up with some kind of an approach to the Houthis uh, that would uh, uh, open the door to a resumption of the political dialogue. So, so I, I think that fundamentally the U.S. role should be to, uh, to enable the U.N. process. I think that the U.N. process is still the right answer for this particular moment. Uh, but there's an awful lot that we can do that would help facilitate uh, uh, that process and empower Martin Griffiths to succeed. Yeah, I mean, I... Uh, uh, the good news about uh, Martin is he rebrands the UN process. Mm -hmm. It was already really distorted. Um, and even the Houthis at one point were not willing to even meet with Ismail or allow him to right. come to Sana'a. So it's important to have someone like Martin right now who looks neutral. He doesn't have to be. He just has to look. Uh, and he actually looks neutral in the eyes of the Houthis, contrary to Ismail, whom to them he does, is not neutral. And that's a good news. The bad news is he inherits so much uglier reality than the former one uh, behind him. Yemen is so worse right now in, in many, so many levels and so many ways. I do think that the U.S. should support the U.N. process, but it should not be taken by the downsides and the deadlocks of the U.N. Because the U.N. has also a lot of problems, um, the U.N. process, in it, and there is a limit uh, to what it can actually do in, by the end of the day. And I think if there is one lesson for Martin, it is, you know, he should not... Uh, he should not work on the UN exclusively or tries to completely dominate the process, piece of process in Yemen. It's bigger than him, it's bigger than the UN. And if he knows another guy who will talk to the Houthis, go ahead and do it. Uh, that's actually important and that's supportive and that will enhance your process and you shouldn't look to it as a, a threat as a UN bureaucrat, but rather an opportunity to emerge within, um, uh, within these things. There are so many cards within the US, I think, that can wave them, still haven't waved them in matter of pushing for peace in Yemen. You waive, you shouldn't do it uh, necessary, but at least you can waive it a new UN security resolution, as old as the current one. You need a new UN security resolution that keeps the soul of 2216, because the soul of 2216 is important, which means you cannot take power by force, and that must be taken. But a new resolution that forgets about the details and the names of 2216. So that way you have something that says, no, Houthis, you're not in power. But also this is not to give power to a failed government in Riyadh and failed names and processes there and be able to abuse it. That's an important one. Second is, there, again, I must say that there must be capitalization on your relationship with the Saudis and the UAE more than Saudi, actually, mm -hmm. uh, because UAE is emerging as the new diet Sunni ally in the region and is actually working hard for U.S. credentials and you can make use of that uh, beyond just some deals and some tactics and I think that will be important in, in, uh, in the long term. I think the Kerry plan is still, for all of its faults and all of its problems and all of its goods, it is still the closest we have gotten to peace in Yemen um, or to what looks like a peace deal and I think that should be activated in a way. And my last point on what should the U.S. do or don't do and it's a concern more than a point is there is recently a lot of conversation about removing the sanctions um, unconditionally and the U.S. is one of the countries that can do this on Ahmed Ali and on others. Um, the bad news is the sanctions have not really worked, at least on the Houthis. You don't punish someone who never leaves Yemen with a travel ban. I wish he actually leaves Yemen. That's a pretty unthoughtful. But the problem with Ahmed Ali, maybe it was effective, but now if you remove it, you're going to do the same sin you did in 2011, which is an unconditional immunity. You have someone, an incentive and reasons to actually go bankrupt and hinder the peace process again. What do you do with that? You create, you use the Iran model, model of, of removing sanctions, which I think is very effective if you will ever have this dangerous thought, which means you behave, in one year we remove your travel ban. You will behave better, maybe in two years we... Uh, remove uh, some of your money, something. You create a buy-in for peace process in Yemen. And you, or most importantly, create criteria rather than a list. Anyone who hinders peace gets in this list, um, we, according to this criteria. Anyone who does good is actually out of this jail chair or punishment chair, whatever you would call it. And that way you redefine the idea of reward and punishment in Yemen. That, that, is, that has been one of the biggest problems in, in, in uh, in the country, I think, since 2011. And that is what incentivized Saleh to come back and uh, try to do his ill thought 
coup is the fact he was unconditionally, you know, he felt very empowered and he looks around him, he sees Syrian president staying on 500,000 people killed, he sees Sisi coming back in Egypt and he says, oh, why can't I do it too? Um, and because again, there wasn't much room to maneuver in 2011, I understand, and to push for that, but we shouldn't do that mistake again. And if there is one lesson learned I would give um, from that time, is it, it's still the same issue. You trade the justice for security, and you ended up losing both. Um, and that's what happens when, 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 when agreements uh, like that are, uh, happens. Yeah, the reality was uh, we would have had the Civil War three years earlier or four years earlier if we had not agreed to the immunity for, for Saul, and that was the hard decision that was made. And you're right, it was a trade-off. Uh, but it was, uh, it was uh, uh, understood at the time that that was you know, the, the, only, the only price that could be paid in order to get no. the agreement. So no. No. Uh, I don't think that we should lift sanctions on Ahmed Ali until he gives back the money that his father stole from the, company, from the country, but that's another story. Um, with, on that note, on that note, we have we have uh, uh, taken all of our time. Uh, Faria has to go to the airport and thank jump you. on an airplane thank for you. some other place. Uh, but uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Basma Alush uh, and uh, Faria Al Muslimi for for coming. I think that this has been a really uh, interesting conversation. Uh, a lot of insights. And I want to thank all of you for uh, joining us this morning. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Aid Mubarak. <laughs>